uh, I'm pretty excited because we have some questions from both of us because we are a gardener, my family gardens, and you guys have a whole farm. We're going to get to your urban gardening story in a moment. So do you, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, sure, sure. My name is Brian Eberfall, right? I go by Eberfall. Uh, I'm the founder and the president of the Black Urban Gardening Society. I'm also uh, currently working as a farm manager here in Baltimore, Strength and Love 2 Farm. Uh, it's a farm right in uh, the middle, of the heart of the city, uh, urban area. So we're working to provide uh, healthy food, fresh food, local food uh, to uh, an extremely food and secure community. Uh, so that's a little bit about me, but I'm definitely honored to be here uh, to speak with fellow gardeners, fellow growers, entrepreneurs. So yeah, this is a great thing. So thank you all for having me. Thank you. I feel like most people know me and my dad. My name is Michaela Omer. I am 16 years old, Austin, Texas, and I'm the founder and CEO of Me and the Bees. And so our mission is to save the bees. But of course, in order to do that, we need to get involved with flowers and gardening. So uh, we started Me and the Bees in 2004 as a um, honey sweetened flaxseed lemonade. And then I'm sorry, in 2009. And then in 2016, I started the Healthy Hive Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization where we save the bees through research, education, and protection. And the protection part is where we get to go turn regular land into bee-friendly land. The education part is where we get to um, teach workshops. And um, the research is when we get to actually do research and figure out what's affecting bees. So I'm really excited to have you. And then, Dad, do you want to introduce yourself? I'm I'm Theo, chief worker bee, proud parent of a uh, awesome, awesome young lady. Uh, glad to be speaking with you. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to learning a lot. You can see we've got our little plot of land here, and I uh, see in the background there that you've got quite the expanse. So. Yeah, we're uh, we're looking forward to the conversation and picking up some tips and tricks from you. Awesome, okay. thanks. Yeah. So the first question that we have for you, Mr. Bryant, is um, tell us your garden story and how you got started. Right. Well, my garden story is uh, probably a story that uh, starts from birth. I grew up in a uh, rural community in, uh, in Tennessee, a little town called Milan, Tennessee which ironically was known as the no-till capital of the world. Uh, so I, in this community, uh, everybody had a guard. Everybody had a guard. And so um, I just grew up around gardens. Uh, my grandparents had a garden. My neighbors, uh, gardens were, you know, pretty much so a central theme of the community. So I grew up in an environment that had fresh food and that people, you know, practice agriculture and things of that nature. So it wasn't uh, sort of something I jumped into later on in life. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be born into an agricultural family. Awesome. Yeah. And, and, and I'm curious to know what inspired you guys to get started going. Uh, you know, so what's interesting is that everybody grows up in these small southern towns. I grew up here. Sorry, I'm losing you. Yeah, Cameron, South Carolina. So um, I can't say that we were farmers, but it was kind of like a farm. We had animals. We had chickens. Of course, we have chickens now here. We had, awesome. you know, pigs. And we just had, we had animals on the property and we also had uh, gardens. And it was um, a different kind of gardening than we're doing now, right? You had a little bit, right. a little bit uh, larger area to garden and a lot of greens and a lot of beans and a lot of corn and uh, it was always fun as a kid it was fun as, as I grew up I really appreciated um, you know really appreciated that that environment and we really wanted to continue that not only from a legacy standpoint but that it's just it's just a good practice right you really right. appreciate nature and right. uh, it really kind of grew into flowers uh, and, and in an effort to really save bees so we sort of combined the two that's that's how I got started and that's how I sort of introduced the kids to garden, just getting them out and planting things. I guess for me, it was growing up. Well, he no longer lives there. We live in Austin now, but growing up with parents who were very outdoorsy, starting butterfly gardens as crafts. Uh, we've had this, is it four by 10? Yes, it's four by 10, yeah. We've had this four by 10 
How long? How long have we had you know, this one? We we uh, we're big. Uh, we we repurposed wood, and we had this set up in another area of the yard for man uh, since really two thousand nine. I mean, since we started the the company, and then we recently moved it here. So we've had had this garden for uh, for a number of years, and obviously we re refreshed the soil. But um, right. we've had it for a number of years. Oh, it looks great! Yeah. Well, thank you. Okay, can I can we ask you a question? Sure, sure. Okay, so uh, what role do urban gardeners play? I guess in just in households, like what does making having your own garden do to your house and your own environment, mm -hmm. and then also as a whole to whole right. habitats? Well, I think urban gardens uh, play such an essential role. In, in, in so many categories, first of all, uh, just teaching people to be self-sustainable, teaching people to do for themselves, um, teaching people to grow their own food. Um, in urban areas, a lot of times people have no familiarity with food. Um, and so to see, you know, what food looks like, uh, I can't miss the amount of times that I've done a gardening workshop and there was a yellow crooked neck squash and somebody said, oh, I didn't know that was a banana. Uh, so so um, gardening, gardening is a great activity. I mean, just for health, for well-being, not just from the nutrition that you can gain from the food, but just from the physical activity. I like to say families who garden together, grow together. Uh, and so I think it's a great exercise for building family, for building community, but also um, that was very powerful is was sort of what segues into what the awesome work that you're doing with the bees. It creates a natural environment. It creates habitat for wildlife to actually have a place to where it can live, to where it can find food, to where it can find shelter. And oftentimes in urban areas, you know, that's, that's missing. That's missing. So uh, urban gardening, urban farms, uh, food needs to be where people are at. And uh, whether it's a garden, whether it's a farm, people need to grow their own stuff. So for us, um, and as far as the impact on the bees, we notice that in urban areas, people replace the um, natural and native plants with lawns and grass. And so those right. are pretty much deadlands for um, many types of pollinators. They can't get any food source or shelter. And so when you start doing urban gardening, um, you're mulching your you're mulching your your um, gardens, which is providing shelter. There's bees that shelter in gardens and many other pollinators. Um, the flowers that uh, the plants produce are food sources. They generate nectar and attract more pollinators to that area. And it's also kind of pit stops so that um, when bees and hummingbirds and um, beetles are going from place to place, they can stop by places that already have, I guess, small little pieces of land that have food and shelter that they need. So yeah. it's really impactful and it's cool when we can get regular homeowners, though they think they can't do anything like, oh, I only have this small little piece of land. You right. can do a lot with that little piece of land. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I definitely agree. I definitely agree. You know, and, and Urban Gardens also, you know, uh, just to see you all, uh, what you're doing and how your father you know, got you in the garden and uh, and all of that stuff. You know, my kids, although we've moved, um, you know, I, I get my kids out in the garden from time to time as well. And, uh, you know, and they're very proud of their gardening prowess. I see the, I see the chickens chicks there. in the back. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, that reminds me, we, we had chickens and we had a beehive and, um, all of that at our at our garden back when we uh, when we lived in Oklahoma. So, so yeah. So that is a it's, it's a beautiful sight to see. Nice. Um, I I'd love to know what's a pleasant surprise that you have uh, encountered urban gar as, as an urban gardener. Oh my gosh, that's a that's almost like a loaded question. There's so many. What are some? What are uh, a few pleasant surprises? A, a few pleasant surprises. Um, years ago, I, I worked a program with the organization and uh, it was with youth. Uh, they had no familiarity with gardening, uh, kids who grew up in the city. And um, we started out in the garden and they were, 
very skeptical of, uh, of, of gardening. You know, what, like you said earlier, didn't think they could do it. And um, the surprise to me was when we started growing crops and growing plants. I mean, these were kids who the first time they saw kale was in the garden. And they're like, oh, I wouldn't eat any kale. And, you know, a few weeks later, you know, they're at the garden on the weekends and they're just totally into it. You know, these kids who could be out hanging out with their friends, you know, having fun. And they call me, they say, hey, Mr. Wright, can you pick us up and take us to the garden? You know, and I'm like, hey, man, it's six in the morning. Y'all want to go to the garden at six in the morning? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, we want to go to the garden. And, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm like, OK, they're up to something mischievous. And uh, so, you know, I'm going to sort of drop them off and drive around the corner and look and see what they're doing. And after about an hour or so of just looking at them working in this garden, I mean, just like they're in a trance. Uh, and looking at them pick up kale and just eating the kale and picking the onions straight out the ground and eating the onions. Uh, it's gardening. Um, gardening is like, it's so transformative. I, one of those kids uh, who I was working with, one day we were walking in the garden and he just looked at me and uh, he had tears in his eyes. I said, man, what are you crying for? You know, I'm nervous. Like, did you get stung by a bee or bit by an ant or something? And uh, he said, this reminds me of my grandfather. You know, we used to garden together and his grandfather had passed away. So gardens, um, you know, just to see the effect that it has on people, to see how people are grounded, how people will stick their hands in the soil and say, this is healing to me. or I feel so good. You know, it's, it's, it's um, I always say it's no coincidence why so many creation stories start in a garden because I just think it's a magical place and it's a place of healing. It's a place of peace. It's a place of serenity and it's a place of power, you know? So yeah, seeing, seeing youth work in gardens who are absolutely not interested in it, but all of a sudden they are, you know, as they would say, we, we, we G's. I was like, you were G. They was like, yeah, we gardeners. Uh, <laughs> so to see them, you know, go from no interest to being G's, uh is is was amazing to me because it transformed their lives that's awesome great what about you though what is a pleasant surprise then a pleasant surprise you know uh i like to uh i like to draw and i like to paint i always like to like to draw i always like art and um i i really got hooked on gardening when we bought a home and i needed to do some landscaping and so, you know, uh, the engineer in came out and I went and looked at plants and had everything, you know, sized and laid out. And I found that planting the garden, to me, it's kind of like artwork. You get to put things together that work together that actually they look well together, whether it's a flower garden or vegetable garden. Um, so, so to me, that was, uh, that was a lot of fun. It just, to me, it just seemed like art. And, um, you know, it's interesting when you put them in and they're small, but after you see them grow, you see them right. grow together and integrate. And especially if you're doing a flower garden, you see how the flowers um, respond to your taking care of them. And I, uh, I just liked, I felt good. It was, um, you know, like those kids you were talking about, it was easy to tell where I was going to be on a Saturday morning because I'd be out just, um, you know, prettying up the garden, man. It's just, it's just a nice feeling. That's one, but I tell you the other one that's surprising to me, you can tell this to your kids. Um, I studied martial arts for a number of years and I found out everybody talks about Zen gardens. And mm -hmm. I found that, uh, you know, years ago, right, centuries ago, martial artists, after they would go and have a war or a fight, mm -hmm. they would go back home and part of what they would do to help them kind of decompress and relax is, they would create these beautiful gardens and they would really take their time to be meticulous about creating these gardens. And that was their form of just, you know, relaxation and decompressing and, you know, getting rid of some of some of uh, perhaps that negative emotion and memory for something that was a little more beautiful. And I, I uh, really resonated and connected with that story. Excellent, excellent. Awesome. And, and, you know, I got one question for you as we prepare okay. to put together our vegetable garden. Wanted mm -hmm. to know, you know, what you thought about uh, companion gardening, right? So we don't have a big space. We're trying to get as much 
you know, production out of the small spaces we can. So I wanted to get your thoughts on companion gardening. Yeah, I think companion gardening is uh is necessary. Uh, yeah, I'm in a high tunnel right now, and uh, all of these flowers you see behind me are um, are kale that was planted in the fall and uh, is going to seed. So during the shoulder season, kale is a great attractive for pollinators. So wow. even when we start to pull this kale out, um, we will keep some kale in here um, to attract pollinators, but we also will plant crops that, that work cohesively together, that benefit each other, that may uh, do some scent masking for to protect you know, a crop from other predators. So in a small garden setting, um, I, I think it's great to use um, the whole square foot gardening method. Right. Uh, but but and, and instead of adding maybe some vegetable crops or things of that nature, adding some pollinating crops uh, for your companion planting, uh, whether it's mint, uh, which can be invasive. So you may want to be careful with that. Uh, whether it's mint and when mint goes to flower, I haven't seen anything that attracts pollinators more than that. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's it's insane the amount of pollinators that you attract I, when mint goes to flower. First, our first lemonade was a uh, lemonade with mint, and it was from mint that we were growing in the garden. So we try to keep some mint in the garden, we keep yeah. a little sage. And uh, is it a good idea to plant flowers and vegetables in the same garden bed? Uh, that's a yes, I yes, do. yeah. That's I think it's absolutely necessary. Not only is it just beautiful, but once again, the flowers will let off scent that can sit and mask other vegetables to protect them from predators. The flowers will attract pollinators to help pollinate your plants. Uh, so, you know, if you're growing tomatoes, if you're growing squash, uh, you're having problems with pollination, yeah, definitely plant flowers. Also the different colors and the different shapes confuse predatory insects. So flowers are really great uh, at masking uh, vegetable crops. And uh, so, yeah. What what flowers do you guys like to plant with your vegetables? What do we have here? Um, we've got sage, we've got blackfoot daisies, purple cone wow. flower. Yeah. Uh, have some uh, salvias here. Yeah. Greg's mist flower. Greg's mist flower. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a great combination. And, and it sounds like you guys have perennials as well. Yeah. Uh, that you don't have to continue to plant every year. Yeah, so that's there's a benefit. A, yeah. There's an organization called the Detroit Hives, and uh, the founder yeah. was telling us also how cool Black Eyed Susans are and, and yes. how they're great for pollinators too, which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah, Black Eyed Susans. Um, I, I've sort of been on a campaign to uh, really let people let their vegetable crops go to, go to seed, go to flower, um, because when all of these plants go to flower, they are, you know, they attract so many pollinators. Here at the farm, we had one house that arugula and mustards and turnips and collards and kale and all of these plants that went to seed. And I, when you walked in it, it just sounded, you just could hear the buzz yeah. from all of the wings just flying around in there. I mean, we, you know, hummingbirds and all types of bees and all types of pollinating flies which a lot of people don't realize that flies are pollinators. Yes. Uh, you know, and flies and different types of wasps. So, yeah, it's, um, you know, really letting plants go to seed uh, is a great thing. And, and if you're growing heirloom crops, the, also the benefit is that you can save your seeds. And uh, those are seeds that you don't have to buy for your next, your next season. Nice. And feel free to send down some of those kale seeds. Oh, we definitely will. Yeah, that's not a problem. One of the things we'd like to do is we like to swap plants with other gardeners in that way. Yeah. That, that, that crop pop up, it reminds us of the person that we got the plant from. So we try to make yeah. sure we share a little bit. And uh, if anyone has anything to share, we make sure we uh, get it and plant it in that special place. And then uh, that's how we remember. Yeah, that's memory crops. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so we... I guess we have talked about the importance of urban gardening. We've talked about some of our favorite parts, some things that surprised us. Uh, if there are any viewers that want to get started or tried starting, I know I know a lot of people who have tried starting and they're like, oh, 
There's way too many pests that were eating mine. Mm-hmm. They didn't stay alive long enough. My, my, I, at least in Texas, my plants die because it's too hot. Maybe wow. what's a beginner tip that you have or something that you had a challenge with that you found pretty helpful? Uh, one of the first things that I would advise all beginner growers uh, is uh, know what zone you live in. Uh, know your growing zone and go to, you know, go to um, any of the ag universities or ag extensions in your area. And they will clearly list what plants you could grow, where you live at, what varieties of cultivar of that plant, when you should plant it, um, and things of that nature. And, and don't grow too much. And know that it's okay to go to Home Depot, Lowe's, or to a nursery store and actually buy some plants. You know, so many people think they have to be purists and everything has to start from the seed. But buy yourself some plants. And help you help you get started, you know, your first season, and then maybe the next season you can move into starting your plants from seeds. But know what you can grow where you live at. I have so many people who live in Michigan and say, "Hey, I want to grow mangoes." Uh, you can't do that. Uh, <laughs> not not outdoors. So yeah, know your know your growing zone, know your location, and uh, research you know, with ag extensions in your area. They'll make it very clear what you can grow and how you can grow it. Cool. That's a good one. Uh, Earth Day is tomorrow. I've been yeah. working a lot to to um, celebrate Earth Day at my school and with um, an organization called Texas Climate Corps, Youth Climate Corps. But mm-hmm. what are you doing for Earth Day and what can people watch do for Earth Day? What I am doing for that. Earth okay. Day is, uh, you know, Earth Day is almost every day for me. Uh, but tomorrow is a particularly a big celebration. So I will be farming tomorrow to celebrate Earth Day. Um, we will be sheet mulching rows in, uh, in our tunnels. Uh, we're going to be recycling old tree waste and uh, setting up environments for, like you said, for pollinators to maybe live. Uh, we're going to be building soil. We'll be uh, planting more seedlings. Uh, so we're, you know, this is an active practice for me on a very consistent basis um, in my life. Uh, it's, it's sort of beyond a hobby, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, it's a career for me. So, um, so yeah, we will we will be um, whether it's composting or mulching or planting, we're gonna be uh, getting our hands done. Got it. Uh, for me, I and think what are your guys' plans? I think for me, I'm going to try to find more ways to uh, reduce waste. Like, I guess mm-hmm. past work days, I've been getting my hands in the garden, uh, working with signing petitions, trying to start workshops. But I want to figure out what things do I already have in my house that I can either repurpose or just not throw away. Uh, and then I'm also working to get the Texas climate plan passed so that's something awesome. that i'm gonna be awesome. working on during earth day revolutionary um, actions yes if you are watching you can try to do a little bit of research or get your hands in some dirt um sign petitions that's helpful honestly earth day is a great day to start learning because some of the things you learn are you're gonna you're gonna want to do all year so maybe take some time tomorrow to find a new content creator or uh, read a snippet of a book. And I'm guessing that that's going to continue until the rest of the year because a lot of these topics are super interesting. That's true, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you want to self-plug and I'm going to self-plug? <laughs> sure, 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 okay. yeah. You could um, definitely check uh, the Black Urban Gardening Society out on Facebook. Uh, we have a YouTube channel under the same name, the Black Urban Gardening Society. So where we teach simple gardening techniques uh for you and also on instagram the black urban gardening society okay and for me it's mostly about earth day i have a an earth day blog up and that's on my website me and the bees.com uh thank you everyone for joining us it was so fun being able to uh go out and talk about gardening something that we're both interested in and learning a little bit about your story mr brian thank you for having me Happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day.